here. How time flies. Time and tide waits for no man. Okay. Thank you, Jayal. That, that was good information, a reminder. So what we were talking about is the sea trials. Boy, they're still coming in. What is about sea trials where the ship owner, one day you will be a ship owner. At least some of you will be ship owners. Because amongst DMT boys, one of my batchmates is a ship owner. Of course, he's got only two ships, but nevertheless, he's a ship owner. A very proud thing to announce. And if you are a ship owner, when you order for a new ship, you need to know whether that ship can perform the function that you are intending to use as your occupation to earn a profit. That means you must transport cargo from one place to another within a limited time. And within that limited time means your ship has to run at a certain speed with that cargo. So when the ship owner gives the order to the ship builder, he tells them, I need a ship of this this capability. So to ensure that capability, he puts that ship to sea trials. That is the purpose of sea trials. All right. Now, for the sea trials, there is an organization called International Towing Tank Conference. It's got a funny name. International Towing Tank Conference. It's an organization of naval architects, scientists, engineers who are basically naval architects and naval architects in as the majority. So they are the ones who design ships from models and they make ships and then they test ships. They have huge testing laboratories and one of the components in the testing laboratory is a towing tank. And this towing tank is where the models are tested, not the main ships. The models are tested and on the basis of the replica of the model, the main ship is made. On the basis of the resistance, the characteristics of a model, the main ship is made. So once the main ship is made, the ship has to be tested. So International Towing Tank Conference arranges for various tests and these tests are taken up by the classification societies. Classification societies means Indian Register of Shipping, Lloyd's Register of Shipping, American Bureau of Shipping, Detnos Veritas. There are 105 different classification societies around the globe. Out of those 105, maybe 110, you will have 15 to 16 of them of very relevant, important ones, and mainly from the developed countries like German Ischel Lloyd, Italy has got it, France has got it, Japan has got it, China has got three classification societies. Maybe it has got four, I'm not sure, but I know there are three of them. So Indian Register of Shipping has got one, IRS. So these classification societies list out the tests that are to be carried out. All right, so I will point out the ones which International Towing Tank Conference has arranged for tests on a ship. I have 19 tests over here. You are not required to memorize them. You are only required to be aware of a corporation of a body called the ITTC and they are the ones which design the tests that are to be carried out for a newly built ship. Number one is the turning circle test and one is the measured mile test. These I think I have already explained to you. Nevertheless, we will explain again when we come into the actual part. Then you have the Z maneuver test. Z maneuver means zigzag test. Then modified Z maneuver test. Then Z maneuver at low speed test. Direct spiral test. Reverse spiral test. Actually, even I don't know the details of these spiral tests and pull out tests and stopping tests. It's very much more complicated and detailed. And this is where a naval architecture will need to know the details of it. You as an engineer will know that such tests are conducted at all. How it is conducted, why it, is, it will never be asked in your examination and you will not be asked of it because it is beyond the realm of your scope of studies. So stopping test, stopping inertia test, man overboard test. Just be aware that there are so many tests that are arranged for a ship 
and it is the ship owner and the classification society which will join hands together to decide which tests the new ship ship that is being procured will follow all right then you have parallel maneuver course maneuver test initial turning test acceleration turning test thruster test grabbing test new course keeping test acceleration test deceleration test crash top ahead test this is an important one this is one that will be done on the ship and i will tell you the importance of it and the last one is also important it is called the minimum revolution test it means the minimum rpm that the ship can continue and this is dependent on the flywheel see when the when the expansion takes place the power stroke it turns the crankshaft and it turns the whole shafting system and the propeller but apart from that it also inputs some amount of energy into the flywheel so the flywheel continues the rotation of the crankshaft to help in the compression stroke of that particular unit so if it has got enough energy it will able to complete the comp compression stroke and if it is able to compress uh, able to complete the compression stroke the firing stroke will also take place so they keep reducing the fuel till the rpm go lower and lower and lower till such time the flywheel does not receive enough energy to conduct the compression stroke so little before that is the minimum rpm that the engine can achieve all right the crash top ahead is there but apart from ahead they have a crash top which is astern also but astern i i am pretty sure no ship owner will ask for a astern crash top astern crash top seldom ever situation arises but it is there as per the list of the ittc i have been through a ship which has had a crash top test during sea trial but they never intended to have the crash top astern only ahead okay so these are the tests now before the sea trial what happens here you are at the start of the trial after engines are warmed up crank web deflections are taken and recorded all right these re readings will be in variation to test bed trial records the first thing you need to know is what is crank web deflections okay now we all know that the crankshaft is in a bed plate and it is supported at the points which are the main bearings okay now these main bearings have to be in complete alignment that means they must be in perfect alignment to ensure that the crankshaft is absolutely straight if it so happens that one or two bearings are not in the same alignment as the crankshaft that means the crankshaft will be lifted at some places it will be down at some places so if this happens when the crankshaft is rotated the crank webs will start moving outwards at one position and as it is rotated towards the upward direction the crank wave will go there and contract together depending on whether the neighboring bearing is up or down i hope you are able to understand when the crank shaft is rotated if the bearings are not in complete alignment which means if some of the bearings are down some of the bearings are up then when the crank shaft is rotated the crank webs will start moving in and out all right so in the shock trials they have almost 100% accuracy of the bed plate and the crank shaft alignment okay why because in the shop in the engine builders workshop the floor is a solid concrete floor there is no possibility of flexibility on the floor so there is no possibility of flexibility in the bed plate so in that case the crankshaft will also remain rigidly straight so when it rotates there will be no deflection of the crank webs why because all the bearings remain exactly in alignment okay now if some bearing wears down more then that part of the crankshaft will go down and then at that neighboring crank web 
will start deflecting more and contracting more. Why? Because that bearing has gone out of alignment. So this can happen over a period of time. But when that engine from the engine builder's workshop is placed on the ship, the ship is not a rigid body like you have on shore. It has some flexibility. Similarly, the tank top in the engine room has some flexibility. Now, I am talking in hundreds and thousands of a millimeter. So, when that bed plate is placed on the tank top, there is some flexibility. So, when you take the crankwave deflection readings, crankwave deflection readings are taken by means of a gauge which is fitted between the crank webs. See, this is a web and this is a web. All right. If the web goes in and it goes out, then there is a gauge in the middle. It's called a crank web deflection gauge. This gauge will record how much is going out and how much is going in. In our time, we used to have like a clock gauge and we used to take the readings. But the more modern crank web deflection gauges are working on remote control and Wi-Fi, rather Wi-Fi. So you have a pad, you have the pad and on the pad you can um, put the positions where you want to take the readings and on the gauge there is a transmitter receiver arrangement and for each position of the crank a reading will come on your iPad. So you don't have to go into the crankcase at all, it is from far, only you have the turning gear switch with you and you keep rotating the engine and keep marking the recordings. So these are the modern techniques which we will deal with when we do crankwave deflections at a later date. I will show you the video, I will show you the means, I will show you the readings, how it is taken. It's one important area of understanding engine behavior. All right. So these readings are taken before the C trials to ensure what is the position of the crankshaft alignment. All right. And these readings will be different from the reading that were taken in the engine builder's workshop. This is one point. Second point is the fuel consumption guarantee for the main engine is always given on the basis of measurements taken at the shop trials only and that is at the builder's workshop. All right. So when the ship engine builder says my engine is very good it consumes only 160 grams per brake horsepower per hour. How do you know it is 160 grams per brake horsepower per hour? Because it has been tested in his shop, in his workshop. And he has had the surveyor there to witness the actual fuel consumption figures. That means he has found out for the power developed on the indicator card and on the brake horsepower card and <clears throat> found out what is the fuel consumption through the flow meter for a stipulated period of time at certain RPM. I have shown you how to calculate the power of the engine. So that power is indicated power. Now you multiply that with your mechanical efficiency and you will get the brake horsepower. All right. So the fuel consumption is given at brake horsepower, grams per kilowatt per hour or grams per brake horsepower per hour. That is the way it is given. So this fuel consumption is what the workshop figures are. It will never be the same on the C trials. Nevertheless, it is a means of comparison between C trial figures and the workshop trial. Of course, the workshop trials will be the best figures that can ever be in the life of that engine. Okay. The fuel consumption during sea trials is for referral verification only. That means when you have your sea trial and you calculate the fuel consumption, it is a record and this record is the benchmark so that at a later date when you want to see whether your engines are consuming the correct amount of fuel or is it consuming excess fuel, you compare it with the sea trial figure and possibly you will not get the exact figure, maybe you will get a little less. But that little less has to be within accepted limitations. All right. If you have any questions, do not hesitate to write it down on the chat column. Next.
plate you go on to is yeah the trial the c trial that is largely inform involve the following functions measured mile trial that is for one nautical mile what is the maximum speed it can get is what it means i will come to that again next is minimum rpm trial i told you just now what is minimum rpm it is keeps reducing the fuel to the engine till such time the engine stops that before it stops what was the rpm that is recorded next is endurance trial these are actually overload trials that means the overload running of main engine is done at 103% of the full rpm for a period of 4 to 6 hours or as contracted by the ship owner now i have earlier told you what is mcr what is csr what is or in that or it was given 10% above the maximum rpm for a period of 1 hour in a period of 12 hours i hope you remember overload rating it is the time period for which the engine is permitted to run above mcr by 10% for a period of 1 hour in a period of 12 hours that's all now during sea trial your endurance trial is for only 103% of full rpm for a period of 4 to 6 hours or as contracted by the ship owner if ship owner says i want it for 8 hours well you have to do it for 8 hours because you are running at only 103% you are not running at 110% of the full rpm all right so this is the time when maximum wear and tear takes place for that engine so after this endurance trial you immediately take tank web deflections again to check the condition of the bearings to check the condition of the main bearing because it has suffered from maximum load so if there is any damage because it is a new component so they have to check whether it is capable of sustaining the stresses that is the reason next you have is the crash top ahead and crash top astern like i told you crash top astern is usually refrained from by the ship owner he has no reason to exert his tip to such stresses because a possibility of astern crash top will be required for astern crash top i suppose you will need a separate switch okay now crash top ahead this crash top ahead is crucial it is important the idea is to save the ship even if the machinery fails that is the idea next is astern movement trial yes now this astern movement trial is important because they need to see whether the propeller is capable of pulling the ship backwards or not because astern movement for the ship is more troublesome in the sense there is more resistance on the propeller if you see in the ahead movement if you see in the ahead movement the propeller is free to throw the water behind the ship all right and propeller efficiency is very high but in the astern movement the propeller is going to draw water from behind and throw it against the ship it is not going to give so much of efficiency that is why it takes more time for an engine to come up to the required rpm say 50 rpm during astern movement and much less time to come up to 50 rpm in the ahead direction so when you take the astern movement you take the time how much it takes to come up to a requisite rpm in fact they pull it on full astern so they have a stopwatch and they use it to see how much is coming at 40 rpm 50% of the maximum rpm 75% of the maximum rpm and 100% of the maximum rpm these are stopwatch recorded and immediately noted down so ultimately in the c trials records it has to be posted so they check the time for astern movement and it could be a small question in your part a examination and the question would be something like this why does it take more time for the propeller to come up to 
say 75 percent of its maximum rpm during the astern movement as compared to the ahead movement why does it take more time for the propeller to come up to 75 percent of its maximum rpm as compared to the ahead movement the reason is that the propeller suffers from more resistance to flow of the water in the astern direction than in the ahead direction so the load on that propeller is much more so it takes much more time to pick up the speed all right so that is why you have your astern movement trial and it's quite different from your ahead movement trial next is coasting stop that means ship comes along the coastline and should be able to stop without starting moving up and down from both sides that is what they check also they have a lot of timing calculations and stopwatches almost everybody will, will be wearing a stopwatch around his neck those are those cheap plastic stopwatches which they use and everybody is taking timing it is like on being on the games field during athletics all the judges have got stopwatches around their necks same thing will be on board the ship during your sea trial there will be about 100 people from the shipyard the whole ship is crawling with people but each one has a designated job to do that is it there are no faltu people hanging around on the ship during that time you have crew members also who are going to assist on the deck for moving the winch machines operating the winch machine etc your job is only to observe and report anything you find unusual or incorrect sometimes you will be able to see that they have damaged something and they have quietly covered it up and later they will say this was not shown to us so it is being shown to us after six months so we don't know that it has happened before so it has to be very well checked out you have to be very alert next is number of starts for main engine to establish air adequacy i mean in other words the bottles we store the air they are like batteries so can astern movement be used as a brake for ship in emergency Karthik, you are asking can we drink water if you are thirsty of course of course it's, this question is something like asking me sir can i drink if i am thirsty of course sir, but uh, uh, yes i was asking like uh, if ship, uh, suppose ship is moving with 40 knots and in that case can we reverse the engine suddenly if uh, we have we are encountering any accident we are suppose encountering any accident suddenly yes, we can yes. reverse the engine yes yes you can and that is part of the crash top i will explain that crash top again and you will understand what happens during crash top because i have been very fortunate to actually see a crash top taking place for a newly built ship if you ever get a chance to go on a ship that is being taken from the shipyard grab it if you hear about your company getting a new built ship in the for commissioning write a letter to them a very sweet honey coated letter to the highest to the fleet manager or to the chief executive officer you must be able to write very good letters and write to them, tell them, sir, I wish to volunteer as one of the engineers to take over the ship. I will give my best in the process. So if you are lucky, you will get a chance. And if you get that chance, it's once in a lifetime. Because very rarely we get chances. They send only experienced people and those who have, you know, blue-eyed boys of the company. If you're a blue-eyed boy, only then you will get it. But if the street manager or the administration is very tight about the quality of people and you show some ability that you are good, definitely they will put you. And it will be a learning lesson for a lifetime. So do not hesitate. And to move the ship backward as a break. In fact, you do. You do that. In fact, when the ship is coming to the harbor or when it is docking, or when it is leaving the harbor, you will continuously get ahead and astern, ahead and astern movements. Why? Because the moment you give ahead movement, the ship starts moving ahead. The moment you stop the engine, the ship does not stop. The ship will keep floating on its momentum in the direction ahead. How will you stop it? 
you immediately put it on astern you put it on astern and stop the engine immediately before the engine starts moving astern and that is the way to make it come to a complete stop maneuvering a ship is completely different from maneuvering a car a car you press the brake and you stand right there but in a ship there is no brake you have to use the movement of the propeller as a brake you are moving ahead even if you give a touch start ahead movement all right the ship starts moving when you stop it doesn't mean the ship will stop the ship will continue because it's already got its own momentum so you will have to give an astern movement to stop it from going any further and possibly hitting another ship especially in the harbor in when you are docking the captain is under enormous stress you see there is a pilot on board but ultimate responsibility is the masters the master has the power to override the pilot's movements as uh, required if he feel the pilot is giving a wrong movement he will tell the helm man to hell with the pilot i am telling you something you do it but that rarely happens because pilots are generally experienced captains but he master is the sole authority on the ship no matter who comes on board even if the fleet manager comes on board even if the chief executive comes on board it is the master who is the final boss of the ship the chief executive officer is the boss so that's the way it is but anyway what i'm trying to say what you are to reverse the engine you have to use it to stop in fact the correct movement of astern movement and then stopping is what will bring the ship to a stand still if the astern movement is too strong then it astern movement will start moving in the astern direction then you will have to give a ahead movement to bring it to a stop and then again if the ahead movement is too strong it will start moving forward so maneuvering the ship requires a lot of practice lot of experience but yes you can use the astern movement to break or stop the movement in either direction astern or head you have to use it there is no break like a car okay so number of starts required admit uh, kartik i hope it is very clear now yes sir okay mrityunjoy has asked how long will it to take to reverse the engine not much time see when you are maneuvering the engine comes to a stop instantaneously the propeller also comes to a stop in it but if the ship is moving at a very good speed then the propeller is not going to stop immediately you can stop the engine immediately declutch the engine that means the clutch has disconnected the engine from the propeller but with the momentum of the ship the propeller is going to be dragged and if you drag the propeller the propeller is going to turn and is going to turn quite fast and that is difficult to stop so in the crash stop what we have the whole program is computerized and on the panel board in the engine room control in the engine control room there is a red colored switch it's a very bold switch and it's got a plastic cover on top of it so that nobody presses it by mistake so similar switch is there on the bridge if it is on bridge control and they see some mishap all they have to do is remove that cover and press down on that red colored switch after that the computer takes full control it is programmed to number 1 it cuts off or bypasses all safety devices for the main engine in other words if there is a safety stoppage for the engine it will not work it will definitely give all the audio visual alarm but you have a choice to mute the alarms because moment the safeties are bypassed the alarm will come so you will see red blue red red all light signals etc but you can mute it in other words it will not be ringing in your ears with all the alarms so the main engine bypass the main engine safeties are bypassed which means the engine has to keep running no matter what whether there is lube oil or no lube oil or whether there is cooling water or no cooling water engine has to keep running the way it has been instructed and what is the instruction that computer will first stop the engine all right declutch or uh, sorry 
before it stops the engine it will declutch the engine and then next step is stop the engine engine stops immediately hardly 5 to 10 seconds it will take for momentary to run and then stop because the indicator box is closed the compression of the air is taking place but no combustion is taking place so the compression itself will help in reducing the rpm so engine comes to a stop very quickly but the movement of the ship when it is moving very fast will drag the propeller in dragging the propeller because the propeller is in water it will start swirling or rather rotating it is something like these hand fans children use if you move it in the air you see it is moving similarly the propeller is being dragged in water so it will start turning now next stop is moment the engine has stopped it will restart in the astern direction and once it restarts in the astern direction and comes up to a certain rpm the clutch will engage with the propeller in other words the engine is moving in one direction propeller is moving in opposite direction this happens for about 15 to 20 seconds which is considerable time period till such time the propeller comes to a stop and the clutch has complete grip on the propeller and then more fuel is given to the engine to rotate the engine and with a larger power in the astern direction so it retards the propeller moving in the ahead direction and then restarts the propeller moving in the astern direction and then maximum power the engine use uses for astern movement this has the braking effect and reduces the ship's movement by a considerable distance in the in the ship that i went through the total distance was stopping without crash stop that means if it is moving at full stop full speed and then you put the fuel to complete stop you take a stopwatch and you take the timing it takes good almost 25 minutes 20 25 minutes to stop and the distance covered was 7 nautical miles from full speed to stop on its own all right during the crash stop we again pressed that button and the computer took over and there were computers during 1979 i am talking about this experience in 1979 that time also we had computerized setup but not to the extent we have today but we still did have so uh, the stopping distance for crash stop was 2 nautical miles and 2 nautical miles is also a quite a big distance so from 7 nautical miles it can be reduced to 2 nautical miles it still does not stop the ship instantaneously where it is it will continue now when the engine was rotating in the astern direction it does not mean the ship was moving in the astern the ship was still moving in the forward direction but but, but it was having a braking effect it was having a braking it was slowing down very rapidly a lot of vibrations are there during that time the whole ship vibrates like anything it's a completely a different experience from your normal cruising so that is it how long will it take to reverse if the engine if it is in the docks in the harbor docking stop start stop start then it is more or less in 2 uh, 3 seconds you start the engine and it starts because air starting everybody thinks air has to go it has to travel here and it has to travel there and then come into the engine and then it start it is like electric you moment you allow the air it is like electric starting almost like starting an electric motor so it is not so slow it is quite fast it is like air starting okay so last point what we saw was number of starts of main engine to establish adequacy of air bottle's capacity so the air bottle is filled up to 30 bar and the surveyor is there to check how many times the engine can start with one air bottle full of air up to a, about 12 bar from 30 bar up to 12 bar the engine should be able to start then difficulty arises in able starting the engine from 12 bar and below engine may turn but it will not fire so there is not enough momentum given to the flywheel 
by the movement of the engine. Air will come into the cylinder, it will push the piston down, whole crankshaft will rotate, but it will not get the momentum. So that is that happens below 12 bar. Up to 13 bar, 14 bar, it can still start, especially if the engine is warmed up or hot. Okay. Other than this, you have the boiler accumulation test. This is when the exhaust gas boiler is running to check the safety valve, which is on the main boiler. There won't be any safety valve on the exhaust gas boiler. It is there on the main boiler. But when the exhaust gas boiler is running, they are connected between the two because it is the exhaust gas from the engine which is heating the coils in that exhaust gas boiler, which is also called economizer. Okay. So those tubes which are circulating the water come back into the main boiler and the hot water that is formed is delivered back into the main boiler. From the main boiler at the bottom, the water is drawn by the circulating pump and sent to the economizer or exhaust gas boiler. And the main engine which is running is discharging the hot exhaust gases through the coils of that boiler. Okay. Now, accumulation test is a test to ensure that the safety valve is of adequate capacity. It means when the safety valve lifts, it should release the pressure. And that release of pressure should be at least equal to the maximum rate of pressure generation by the boiler when it is working. All right. In other words, uh, what this field or what we know is even though your safety valve might have lifted, but the hot water which is generating steam may generate steam at a faster rate than the rate at which the relief or safety valve can release the pressure. So what happens then? Then slowly but surely the pressure inside the boiler keeps building up. This buildup of pressure, if it is left uncontrolled, what will it happen? And you say Ram Nam Satya hai. That's all. The whole boiler will explode. So to avoid this, you need to have this accumulation test. And this accumulation test is allowed for a boiler to rise in pressure up to 10% above the maximum working pressure. If your boiler maximum working pressure is 8 bar, so the maximum accumulation pressure allowable is 8.8 .8 bar. All right. The pressure at which it lifts, the safety valve lifts, is 3% above the working pressure. If the working pressure is 8 bar, so how much will it be? 8.24. Sorry, 8.24. Yeah, 8.24 bar it should lift. All right. Okay. What is the hydraulic test pressure of the boiler? The hydraulic test pressure of the boiler is one and a half times the maximum working pressure. In other words, 8 plus 50 percent, as a 4, 12 bar will be the uh, test hydraulic test pressure. In other words, after the boiler is repaired or newly constructed, the boiler is subjected to hydraulic pressure. It is filled up with water right to the tip and from the top you have a pipe connected to a hand pump and this hand pump is also connected in that pipe to a pressure gauge so they maintain that gauge pressure to 12 bar and keep that valve closed so the 12 bar has to retain for about half an hour or 45 minutes or something so that is a hydraulic test the safety valve must lift at three percent above the working pressure that is 8.24 bar if the working pressure is 8 bar the accumulation pressure test can be 10 percent above the working pressure which means 8.8 .8 bar i hope everybody is understanding what i am talking Karthik? yes sir okay let's move on next the test is torsional vibration and actual vibration 10.30 to 11.30. Okay, we don't have too much time. 13 minutes more. So, engine room, torsional vibration, axial vibration. I showed you what are torsional and axial vibration dampers. They are also called detuners. 
so they are checked whether they are actually dampening out to measure these vibration levels they have what are called accelerometers accelerometers are vibration measurement readers vibration measuring instruments and these accelerometers they use what are called quartz crystals they can be tourmaline crystals they, there are so many of them and these are piezo electric functional crystals because a piezo piezo electric substance is substance which if you squeeze we generate an emf between the two surfaces and this emf is proportional to the pressure that is being exerted upon them and this crystal is used in the accelerometer to check how much of vibration takes place for vibration to take place there is pressure fluctuation on these crystals and this emf which is generated is passed through a transducer to make it steady and the emf generated is directly proportional to the vibration that is being developed so on that accelerometer you get a direct reading of the vibration level where amplitudes are concerned and also the frequency both are easily measured through these accelerometers and they use piezo electric crystals which can be quartz crystals or tourmaline crystals do read up on these matters because if i start on these subjects then we can't finish the subject at all we we'll keep on and it goes further and it grows and it grows and it grows till i start talking about something completely different from our present topic but i hope you are making small small notes to read up on these subject matter those are little out of our syllabus but if it generates interest in you it can be very very interesting and it will definitely add to your engineering acumen and skills all right so engine room noise levels are also measured so they have noise measuring devices which are diaphragm operated so diaphragm movement will immediately record on their electronic devices what is the vibration level they have a limitation engine noise level is one of the annexures in the pollution under marpol and it is a modern one and it has i don't know if it has been executed as yet as yet i don't think it has been implemented but there are levels which the classification societies have in their control and they maintain those levels next is blackout and emergency generator trials you see to test the emergency generator you have to create an emergency so what they do is simply shut off the main generators inside the engine room and it is totally blackout pin drop silence you can hear people breathing around you it is so quiet which is unusual for a ship's engine room and uh, within a stipulated time it is 45 seconds that the emergency generator has to come on and the only the emergency lights will come on and in some ships they have power for the radio equipment and some power for a possible emergency compressor sometimes not always some ships have it some ships don't so the emergency lights which come on are different from the normal lights that are there it is not that the emergency power is sent to the normal lights and the normal lights come on no the emergency lights are separate and they are placed strategically in the engine room in the accommodation in the paint room in the bridge elsewhere under normal circumstances when you are in the engine room and the main lights are burning you will see some lights are not burning these are not defective these are emergency light and to distinguish them beside the light there will be a red marker a red the size of a much bigger than a coin i will say uh, about 2 inches maximum 2 inches diameter will be a red painted circle to identify an emergency light this emergency light is checked by the electrician every saturday because he needs to know whether it is working or not because it may be off during normal time and it may be defective during normal time and you think it is emergency light so it is not burning so every saturday he has a program to check all the emergency equipment okay so that is your emergency generator trial then you have your auxiliary generator load trial auxiliary generator 
is a diesel engine basically running in alternator. This diesel engine may not be from the same manufacturer as your main engine manufacturer. It can be somebody else. So now that engine manufacturer, when he sold it to the shipyard, he told the shipyard, my generator can do 750 kilowatts at full load on this specific fuel oil and it can run for days non-stop, non-stop, 24-7. So that has to be tested out. So what we are told on board the ship to run it at full load, never mind if it gets broken, never mind if it gets damaged, you run it at maximum load they have put it. If anything happens, the engine builder or the ship builder will rectify those problems. Believe me, that is what is told and that is a learning lesson for most of us engineers on board the ship. Why? Because invariably those generators cannot take the load and they fail. And when it fails, you have to do the work to get them back on. And at a later date, the engine builder or the shipyard will replace the parts that are damaged. And which are the parts that are damaged? The valves. They are burnt out. In some engines, you'll find the valves, are, there is no valve. They burnt out totally. And from the funnel, blue flame is coming out. Oxyacetylene flame. So it happens like that. It has happened to us. That's why I can give you a first-hand information on these matters. So ultimately, it is a learning experience. You keep running the generator. No problem. If the generator fails, you are not going to be blamed. Because the ship owner, ship builder has told you it can run at 750 kilowatt and you are running it at 750 kilowatt and then it has collapsed. You are not to blame. But once the sea trials is over, guarantee period is over, then you run your generator very carefully because if you run it at more than 725, the generator will cop it. You keep it at 715 kilowatt. If another generator is required, start another generator, but do not let it exceed because the valve will burn out and ultimately you will be repairing the valve at the cost of your company. So that is how it is. So it's a very good learning lesson really on board the ship for a sea trial. Anything can break, anything can get damaged with normal handling within the limitations guaranteed. And then if it fails, the uh, shipbuilder will be ident uh, responsible. He bears the onus. Okay. Next, what we have is the auto changeover of essential pumps. Now, for each system, piston cooling water, jacket cooling water, lubrication oil, nozzle cooling, everything has got two, two pumps and both the pumps are in working order all the time. So if one fails, the other one must start automatically. There's a circuit within the panel board of that pump then there are three positions of that selector switch. Either it is off or it is on in uh, manual or it is on automatic. On manual, you'll have to press the switch which is there, green and red, to start it manually at the pump station. If you put it on automatic, if you press it from here, it will not start. It will start from the control room because it is on automatic. So that if one of them fails, the other one will start automatically. So this has to be shown by the shipyard. And moment he shows it, he will ask you to sign a register that this piston cooling water pump auto trans auto changeover has been shown. Signed, Karthik Kesari, third engineer. And Karthik Kesari becomes responsible if it doesn't work in future. All right. Okay. Next, what you have is Freshwater generator trials. Freshwater generator trials, when the freshwater generator manufacturer, he is another supplier to the shipyard. So, freshwater generator, purifier, air compressor, these are all engine, they are manufacturers, no doubt, but they are called vendors. I'm a vendor and I can supply you, supply the shipbuilder with air compressors, with uh, purifier, with air, uh, with uh, pumps, motors, everything. Why? Because I am a dealer. So I am a vendor for the ship builder. He tells me and I procure from everywhere. If something goes wrong, I immediately refer to the engine builder uh, or the machine builder or the machine manufacturer that your pump. So their people will come and rectify the problem. So freshwater generator also has to be tried out 
to show that it can perform what has been quoted in the manuals then auto change over from diesel oil to heavy oil and vice versa see sometimes you require to change over from heavy oil to diesel oil previously it used to be manual now it is totally automatic you press a button and all the sensors the valve opening the steam opening are automatic but before it is automatic you must know what happened which valve is to be opened when in sequence the idea is not to subject the diesel oil to the temperature that the heavy oil has to undergo to retain the required viscosity during fuel injection so this timing is very has to be very careful so that the diesel oil when it comes into the line is not subjected to very high temperature otherwise what will happen the diesel oil will start gasifying once it gasifies the pipeline the full of gas no longer fuel the fuel injection cannot take place your engine will stop and then you have to prime the lines and a lot of work is involved to get the lines filled up with oil again safety functions slow down and shut down you see if the lube oil pressure drops from 4 bar to 3 bar let us say the engine has its own intelligence to slow down from full speed to half speed why because the lube oil flow has reduced because the pressure has dropped for some reason why because the lube oil going to the bearings is not only lubricating the bearing it is also cooling the bearing it is the cooling media so if the cooling media is inadequate the bearing will start overheating though the pressure is 3 bar so that is why it slows down the engine to generate less heat in the bearing because less lube oil is coming to cool the bearing so this slow down and if the pressure from 3 bar drops to 2 bar engine will shut down automatically the engineer's action is not required all right so during endurance tire trial every hour records of pressure temperature rpm power indicators the are the taken by the shipyard engineers in the presence of the guarantee engineer the surveyors from dg shipping and classification society and the owners representative that is the chief engineer and master actually master will be on the bridge so he will be watching from the bridge the rpm meter he can't watch anything else next they check is the adequacy of the engine room ventilation that means the air coming into the engine room should be adequate and the engine room is generally under a little higher pressure than what is outside the engine room why because the turbochargers are drawing the air from the engine room so they need a positive head at the suction you cannot give them a condition of vacuum so the quantity of air drawn for the engine will be reduced so we try to keep maximum pressure inside the engine room by blowers blowers draw air from outside and pump air into the engine room so that the engine room is under marginal pressure so that the turbochargers can function satisfactorily and thereby the main engine can also satisfactorily work adequacy of control room and ac ventilation the control room is air conditioned not for your comfort but to keep all the electronic devices that are assembled there all under a cool temperature because electronic parts sensors chips transducers etc all the electronic components which make up for a circuit board on your mother circuit board they are all kept under a cool temperature so that they function properly not for your comfort above list is only indicative and not exhaustive additional tests done on various machinery based on contractual agreements is at the time of confirmation of purchase hmm got still some more steering gear steering gear is another trial that has to go through and it is operated to move the rudder from 35 degrees on one side to 35 degrees on the other side in a 28 seconds and vice versa with single pump operation that is one after the other at full ahead rpm and at the start of each trial sometimes they take it at 75% load also 25% load also to make sure that the steering gear works as and when required there yeah, same is tried out at half engine power sometimes three quarter engine power 
Apart from these, you have anchoring trial. That how much time it takes to drop the anchor. Then you have how much time it takes to remove the anchor from the seabed. The main length of that anchor chain is about 80 meters. Then you have a break test. Whether the break for holding the anchor chain drop can hold it or not. Otherwise, if it slips, then it's bad. And the rate of hoisting an anchor is 9 meters per minute. Then you have your navigation trials, you have progressive speed trials, Z maneuver trials, and you have your turning circle trials, which I will show you just now, navigation equipment trials and engine room trials. Engine room trials means all the pumps and purifiers and small, small items are also tried out because it is made as a contractual agreement. The ship owner has made it an agreement that all the equipment you install in my engine room has to be tried out in front of my engineer and shown to be working satisfactorily. So on the basis of that, all the engine room equipment are also tried out. Now this is the diagram for the measured mile layout. The ship is a little away from the coastline and on the coastline you have two masts or rather four masts fitted in line. So when the ship is going to move, it starts moving from this point at full speed. And when it comes to this point, the stopwatch is clicked and the ship is allowed to move straight along. And again, at this point, stopwatch is taken. It's like taking 100 meters athletic athletes, Usain Bolt doing the speed test. So again, the ship is made to turn around from there, which is called this turning is called Williamson turn. And then again, the whole thing is done to record in the opposite direction. You see, in one direction, there might be wind, there might be uh, what you call current, etc. So when it comes in the opposite direction, it will be in favor. So ultimately, the average value is calculated for this purpose. Okay. Similarly, you have a zigzag maneuver, which is called the Z maneuver. So you see the square movements are the movements of the rudder and the movement on the curves are the movement of the ship. So this can be varied and the timing is checked for the response of the vessel as compared to the rudder movement. That is your zigzag movement. This is your turning circle movement. So when the ship is at a certain point, a movement is given on the rudder and the ship starts moving, not instantaneously, but after some time. You see, it starts moving from here. And then when it starts moving in the form of a turn, it takes all the points and how much it, time it takes to make a complete circle. This circle diameter is measured by means of a GPS. So you cannot obviously get off the ship and start measuring on the water. So you have a GPS to give you an identity, an identification of how much is the diameter of the turn. For this, I have a question for you. I have asked the other sections also and they possibly know it by now and I've given them the answer also. But you try to think for yourself for the answer that I'm about to give you or for the question that I'm about to give you. Now, a ship is moving at full speed ahead and the rudder is turned 10 degrees port quickly. Which side will the ship heel over and why? Okay. A ship is moving at full speed ahead. The rudder is turned to 10 degrees port. Which side will the ship heel over and why? Okay, that is the question. Oh, mama, God, got a lot of it. Okay, here is the crash top. The crash top, I have already told you what it is. In this test, the stopping ability of the vessel is assessed. The time taken by the vessel to come to a complete halt is recorded. The test is also carried out from full astern to full ahead condition. But that is rarely done. From astern to ahead, no. Ahead to astern, yes. During this function, safety cutouts are isolated. Audio alarms are muted by choice. Objective is to save the vessel even at the cost of possible machinery damage. But I have been through the test. Machinery does not really get damaged. And this test is not done repeatedly. Once in a lifetime or once twice in a lifetime, you need to have a crash stop. That's all. The distance for stopping are recorded. So is the timing. Timing also is recorded. Okay. If all the performances are satisfied, 
the vessel is handed over to the ship owner under signatories of the DGS and the CS surveyors, the shipyard representative, the guarantee engineer, the owner's representative, that is the master and the chief, yes, chief engineer. Okay. Test bed shop trials that carried out in this, this should have been much earlier, but anyway, test bed or shop trials is carried out in the engine builder's workshop with the help of a dynamometer. With the help of a dynamometer, you calculate the brake horsepower. And with indicator cards that can be done anywhere, you calculate the indicated power. All right. Now, if you have indicated power and brake horse power, you can always calculate what is the mechanical efficiency. And that is brake horse power divided by the indicated horse power. Okay. So, over here, the power is calculated in the workshop by T into W where torque into angular velocity. The torque is measured directly on that water dynamometer, one of which we have in our workshop in college. So, when you are in college next time, look at that water dynamometer with a little more interest otherwise it is just another piece of iron okay by controlling the amount of flow to the dynamometer we can call calculate the torque here the engine is run at minimum rpm which will be lower than the dead slow this is your dynamometer in action okay next what we have is shock trial records are manufacturer specifics in which he has to prove his quotation figures about the engine. So when the engine manufacturer tells the shipyard that my engine can do this much, so he has to prove it. And that proof is actually done in the witness of the classification society surveyors. So the surveyors have signed the documents and the engine builders have shown the shipbuilder that look, this has been certified by IRS shipping. Okay. Then you have minimum specific fuel consumption at 75% of MCR, MCR load on the engine, turbocharger matching between ma engine and turbocharger, which is crucially important. Otherwise, the whole purpose is lost. Then during the test bed trials, the manufacturer of the engine, he takes all the parameters and he makes a graph against the load. What is the load? The load is the indication made by the arm on the governor. If you remember when I was teaching you fuel pumps and VIT control, that governor arm was moving through an arc. And on that arc, you have calibration from 0 to 10. So that is your load. If your load position at 6, you will find out what is the maximum pressure at a load position at 6. That means your peak pressure. Similarly, compression pressure. Similarly, scavenge pressure. Similarly, scavenge exhaust gas temperature receiver. Then exhaust gas temperature after the valves. So all these parameters are recorded against load. And here is the graph which I have obtained. And this right now is not really readable. Even I cannot read it because the figures are so small. But I will share this link with you and you try to expand it or you will get this link directly from the net. Yes, Karthik, ship me here. Is the Stabo said because of the semi -blue. Karthik, there is no direct answer. Not that you are incorrect. But before it heals to the starboard, something else happens. What happens? Give me an engineer's answer. Otherwise, what you say is correct. But this happens at a later stage. There is no direct answer. You give me an engineer's answer. What you're giving me is a, a not even an architect. Naval architect will also not give this answer. A, a layman's answer. Okay. Karthik, you're right. You're not wrong. But something more happens before it heals to the starboard side. Why does it happen? And why does it heal to the starboard side? Answer is not complete because of centrifugal force. Centrifugal, where does the centrifugal force arrive? If there is a centrifugal force, then the whole ship should move. No? Why does it heal over? A more detailed answer. I will give you, at some stage, I will give you the answer. But try to do a little brainstorming within yourself. It helps and you'll never forget. So if you're asked by an MMD examiner, you can give him a very specific detailed answer. 
the other college boys will say us answer like this. <sighs> sorry the other college boy the other institution boy you see at direct so it will heal to the stab out but you as an engineer will explain why it happens before it heals to the stab out and then how it heals to the stab out side okay so this is a graph i promised you half an hour and i have taken 13 minutes more time for you so anyway i hope you are able to understand the subject and if you do have any more questions do not hesitate to ask along with this link i am going to send you a complete long list of questions with, with no answers the answers are not given but you will work out the answers using your mind if you are given the question and the answer your mind your mind tends to be a little lazy so you will not intend to find out so i will give you a list of questions some of them are very basic and most of them you will be able to answer but at the latter stage it goes more in depth with the subject and i hope it will be of a learning lesson especially online you are becoming online engineers it is being a stamp on you you know uh, it's not a nice thing to happen at a later date 10 years now they will ask you oh were you an online engineer it becomes a negative remark so i am hoping this online classes end and we get back to our normal classes otherwise you will be branded as online engineers so everything you do with your laptop and fix things we does not happen for marine engineer anyway that's all for today go ahead and enjoy your holiday i hope you not got to get meet us for other classes also again so that will be all for my side today and take care if you have any questions you can ask if at all okay no question all right 36 boys are there and uh, who, who is the class in charge paran i need to know who are the absentees so there should be actually um 38 two boys are absent so two boys will have to i need to know the attendance of two boys all right paran yes sir yes sir I'll oh, send oh okay okay right on bye bye take care see you next week and next week we will do lubrication chart be there all 38 boys it's an important uh, chapter and we'll go a little fast because it's a long chapter okay okay bye bye take care thank you sir